Welcome back to the shop, everyone. This saw has waited decades to be running, and today's the day we get to see her slice some wood. On this episode, we try to stand a penny on edge, hose down a bandsaw, and change metal colors. In case you missed the previous episodes, we over-engineered a motor mount. We built a shark tooth cabin slot construction guard and built a wooden wheel blade guide counterbalance system. So in order to get this saw running, we have a couple things to do. I want to blue some existing parts that we already made in previous episodes and then tie up some loose ends with some fabrication by building some knobs, take care of the belt guard in the back and do some existing tabletop work to it. I'm ready to get to work because I can't wait to hear this saw running, so let's go do it. Cold blue hides all the grinding and bare metal. It also looks the best if you apply randomly and make it all blotchy. If left on the metal too long, it can actually rust. And that's exactly what I'm going for in some areas. The table is the only part of the saw that I'm actually going to be interacting with, so it needs to be smooth, but I still want to have some age show through. I added some all thread to the stationary table. This way it'll help aid in alignment to the main surface plate. I made a few more six-legged dead spider knobs to hold this guard in place. I'm checking the belt pulley for run out with a dial indicator. This is going to help with bearing, belt life, and also keep the vibration out of the machine. I really like the way the shadow effect looked on the main guard, so I'm going to add some to the belt guard in the back too. And this is also going to tie the whole machine look together. So I really like the way the shadow effect turned out on this guard. I like the table, I like all the brackets and knobs. But because this belt guard and blade guard are such huge key components of the look of this machine, I have an idea and I'm gonna take your suggestion and I totally agree with you that we should patina the guard. So let's do some shop science. For this experiment, what I want to be doing is using these patinas to change the look of the guard behind me. And I don't know which one to pick. So we're gonna be sampling all of them and seeing which one I like the best. Now, I originally found these patinas from my friend Reed. During his shop tour, he kind of turned me on to them and said, hey, you should try some patinas on your guard. So I purchased some, and we're gonna make ourselves a little Rolodex sample book that you and I can always reference at any time to see what kind of patina we like that might suit our project the best. So let's do some sampling on these big pieces of cold roll plate. So this one will change the metal Auburn. This one will turn it rusty, gold, you have copper, you have bronze, you have pewter, blue halo, torch, black, and flame. The first thing we need to do to get this patina applied is get the plate really clean. I'm going to use acetone to wipe all the yuckies off on both sides. If it's not clean, then the patina won't work that well. In order to clean the plate, you can sandblast it, wire wheel it. I'm going to use steel wool to clean it because that's how I want to clean the guard because the guard is so big I can't put it in my sandblaster. So I'm going to replicate this test with steel wool. But all the oils need to be off just like you were painting it or applying any other finish to this. So all these patinas cost me about $200. They're not cheap, but it's really hard to achieve this look without them. This is a very quick finish. You don't have to wait for paint to dry or send something out to powder coat. Like, will this stuff melt your face off? No. For best results, some of these need copper as the base. I'm gonna start with the copper. 
Ooh, cool. So then I just let it sit for a little bit and then we go into the water to neutralize. Now we blow it off with the hose. Before, after. Isn't that cool looking? But we could apply this again if we want to and get a little darker. That's what's crazy about this. Next is the rust and copper. So we just need to kind of let it sit and we might be able to come back and apply a little bit more. Bronze with copper. Whoa, that is cool looking. Okay, I'm gonna dip it, neutralize. Pewter, add shadows, darkening, and highlights of golds, bronzes, browns, reds to your copper. Auburn, let's do Auburn. That's cool, huh? Let's do torch effects. Look at that, that's not cool or what? Okay, black. Here we go. This is the one I think that's gonna look the best. I'm just gonna keep going with it. That's not cool, you can just keep changing it. Whoa. This one is flame. That's cool looking. Blue halo. Whoa. Okay, rusty gold with copper. Let's do some cold blue. I wanna try this, cause this is what I did all the other parts with. Cold blue. And we will apply with a rag. But this is the problem, right? So you're gonna be faced with these big surfaces. What do you do? How do you apply it? Well, you're gonna to have to spray it. Let's take a look at what we got. Take a look at how cool all these samples are. I'm so glad I took this extra time to develop this little, I don't know, collection of patinas. And after careful consideration, I think this is my favorite coupon out of all of them. And it's black with torch and black applied again with a satin finish over the top of that. that I just applied with a Krylon spray. And I really like the elements of depth by adding a couple of different patinas all into the same coupon. And I think it's just gonna look killer on the machine. And it's gonna keep this old timey look that I really like, but still adding a finish so that it's just not pure plain Jane metal. So I'm ready to apply this patina and I cannot wait to see what this whole thing looks like when it's all done. So let's get to it. There's a few cool things about applying the patina. One, you really can't screw it up. And two, you can sand it off if you don't like it. And three, if I plan on doing a restoration down the road, it's really not in the way and it's easy to cover up later. It is really fun to experiment with and explore different looks. Patina on the guard is really giving me a cool steampunk vibe. It looks original and ties the old saw and new guard together well. The very last thing we're gonna do before we turn this beast on is answer some questions that you guys have about the machine. So let's start right here at the saw guide. I wanna address some of the questions you guys had about this bar when I said it was twisted. And yes, I didn't explain myself very well. The physical bar is straight, but the twist where the bar comes from is in this receiver right here. Whoever poured the Babbitt that this bar slides up and down in didn't get it perfectly straight and that's a lot harder problem to fix. So that's why I did what I did. The next question you guys have is what is this wheel on the bottom of this machine? And this is what allows you to unlock to tilt the table. Put it at any angle up to about 45 degrees then you can lock it down and you're ready to go. Pretty cool. What is this big ugly round thing that sticks one foot off the back of the machine? And this is the blade tensioner. So when you push it in, 
it puts less tension on the blade. You pull it out and you lock it down, it puts more tension on it. And this is to accommodate different widths or thicks of blades. And this is just a really simple approach to tackling this problem. But what's really clever is the other end of it. So let me show you where that bar attaches to. The other end of this bar goes to this screw. And you adjust the screw to get your correct blade length. And then to set the tension, you can see that this screw is floating inside this housing and the weight keeps it floating and you can balance it right in between there. So if there's any little interruptions, what's going on as you're cutting, this blade can float and provide perfect tension all the time. It's a pretty clever system, really simple, nothing to go wrong, except for it adds a lot of length to the overall machine, but it's pretty effective. How big is this goofy thing? So let's measure it. Edge of table to the back of this bar is six feet long. So that's pretty big for a bandsaw. How high is it? From floor to top of the guard measures eight foot one. So pretty tall. How big is the table? The table's 32 by 30. So pretty good sized table from blade to throat. 34 inches, 35 inches or so. The next question is how heavy is this beast? So let's weigh it. Looks like almost exactly 800 kilograms. That's 1,763 pound bandsaw. And finally for the last question is was this time worth putting into this machine to getting it running? So I've devised a little experiment where we're gonna stand a penny up on edge on the table, turn the machine on and see if the penny falls over or if it stands up. This is my gauge of saying, how does the machine transfer its energy into my work or into myself? And it's kind of a quality gauge that will show us how much vibration this machine has. Standing a penny on edge without the machine running is hard enough. Machine coming on in three, two, one. Well, this old saw still has some life left in her. So what do you say we give this old girl a proper welcome back? Well, the machine exceeded all my expectations. It's really exciting to see this machine come back to life after sitting dormant for so long. And having it here in the machine shop, it's just an absolute beauty to look at. And I cannot wait to have a project for it. And I thank you guys for joining me on this cool journey to get the saw where it is. And I'll catch you guys on the next one.